Good morning, welcome. So, um, if you've been coming for the first time over the last two months, you probably haven't a clue who I am. Um, Because Sue and I have been visiting relatives, so for the last two months we've not been around. But um, my name's Craig, and alongside Ben and Andrea, I've got the great privilege of uh, being one of the elders and pastors here at SCF. So today is Remembrance Sunday, uh, so we will be um, standing with the rest of the country uh, at 11 o'clock, and I'll try and get as as close as I can uh, to 11. If you've got very small children and you find that they're struggling, then please feel free to go out to the den, but we're a family and therefore we expect a little bit of noise and whatnot, so don't be too precious about things. Um, the, the only notice I've got is uh, to remember the shoe boxes. Next Sunday, the 17th, is the last day to bring in your shoe boxes. Um, there's instructions at the side of the, uh, of the stage here. Um, I noticed that there aren't any uh, shoebox templates that are out at the moment. So if somebody could take the job of opening the, um, the parcels underneath so that people can get at them, that would be a real blessing. So um, they've all gone. There's three big cardboard packets underneath. That's different. They've all gone. Right, you've got to find your own shoe boxes. <laughs> That's all right then. So, um, Lord, we thank you for this morning. Uh, I was reminded as we prayed beforehand those words from Godfrey Bertel, just one touch from the king. And uh, so, Lord, I pray that you touch each and every one of us this morning, um, that we would go out different from when we came in, that our praise and our worship would be acceptable in your sight, and that, Lord, our praise and our worship would be a blessing to you. So, Holy Spirit, lead and guide us and uh, move amongst us, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. Shall we rise and enter into the time of worship? I will ask if you do feel like you have a word or a prompting from God and you wish to share it, please do come and speak to Craig at the front, who is our meeting host. If you feel that you have anything to say, Craig will speak to you at the front. So we will enter into a time of worship.
So Lord, we just worship you this morning. We just praise your mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Jess, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, perhaps take your seats. Um, so um, today is Remembrance Sunday. And uh, we're joining with countless people around the country to remember those who gave their lives so that today we could be free. Together we're going to uh, watch a, a short video. And parents, carers, please feel free to explain um, the symbolism behind some of the images that you see on the video. Um, to many of us, those symbols are, are clear, but uh, unless somebody tells us, how are we to know? So uh, please feel free to explain what's going on in the video. Um, at the end of the video, I'd ask those of us who are able to stand, you'll hear a bugler play uh, the last post. We will then stand in silence for the two minutes. At the end of that two minutes, you'll hear the bugler play Ravalli, um, and um, I will then pray at the end of that, uh, at the end of that piece. So um, this is a, 
a solemn time, but it's a, a time for joy too, isn't it? That we can be free. And the one who gave his life for us all, Jesus Christ, he gave his life so that every single one of us could be free, and free indeed. So, uh, Chris, if it's okay, we'll play the video. So uh, if you're able, then uh, perhaps you could stand.
God of all comfort, we remember in humble gratitude all those who've given their lives in war. And we pray for all who still live with the physical and mental scars of combat. We pray for places around the world where war is still a daily reality. Draw near to all who mourn lost loved ones and strengthen all who work for peace. Lord, in your mercy, heal and restore. Jesus Christ, friend and companion, we pray for all who've had to flee their homes because of conflict and who find themselves adrift in a land that isn't home. We dream of a safer, kinder world where every displaced person will find refuge and where communities destroyed by war will thrive again. Lord, in your mercy, heal and restore. Holy Spirit, breath of life, we lament the way in which war damages this beautiful earth you have created, ravaging landscapes, destroying ecosystems, and preventing crops from flourishing. Brood over the chaos again, we pray. Bring order and balance, and birth new life in barren places. Lord, in your mercy, heal and restore. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God in perfect unity, we long for an end to strife, strife between nations and strife in our local communities. Teach us to pray for peace, to work for peace, to live in peace, and we look forward to that day you have promised when you will cause wars to cease to the ends of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, heal and restore. Amen. Amen. Children, young people, um, thank you. Thank you for being with us. I pray a blessing upon you uh, and upon your teachers, leaders this morning that you will experience a new touch of the Holy Spirit this morning upon each and every one of you. So, um, band, Jess, band, you're going to lead us again. Thank you.
verse one and sing from the top it's so good and it's so good i almost can't believe it and far beyond what hearts could ever dream the god who said the galaxies in motion would descend to give his life for me 
faithful one could make perfection plead for sinners what needs a king to pay so great a cost and all my life my heart will sing the answer only the love of God for singing all
who rules over God's people, let us go right into the presence of God with true hearts, fully trusting him. For our evil consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood and making us clean. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. So without wavering, hold tightly to the hope we have, for God will keep his promise. Amen.
let's just be still. Let's just be quiet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you never will fail us. Um, but, uh, Lord, we recognize that your timing isn't always ours. And uh, sometimes the good things that you have for us, um, we just have to wait a little time until your timing, because your timing is perfect. And, uh, Father, you're in charge. So, uh, Father, we, uh, we thank you for our time of praise and worship this morning. We pray for Andrea now as she comes to share with us. Um, Holy Spirit, move within her. Thank you for the time that she spent preparing. And, um, Holy Spirit, we pray that um, your words will be her words as she shares this morning. Open our ears, open our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I 
am a meal planner. I'm not one of those people who will just go arrive home and think, what shall I have for tea? That never happens in my house. I am a planner, I plan ahead, I shop ahead, I batch cook, I make stuff in advance. I am very organized when it comes to food because it's important to me. <laughs> I do not open my fridge and find nothing. That doesn't happen, praise the Lord. But I plan around it. I have daily habits built around food. And I'm sure many of you do the same, maybe not the same as me, but I'm sure we all have our habits involving the times that we eat. There is the what, there is the when. But what I want us to think about today is the who with. Luke's Gospel is full of stories of Jesus eating with people. And as we can see from this slide, just Luke's in particular, obviously there's other references in uh, the other Gospels, but here we can see Matthew 5, he eats at the home of Levi, <laughs> the tax collector. Luke 7, he eats with Simon the Pharisee. In Luke 9, we have the feeding of the 5,000. In Luke 10, He's at the home of Mary and Martha, and you may remember um, it's Martha who's upset because she's been left to do all the cooking, and Mary's listening to Jesus. We then have another meal in Luke 11 with the Pharisees, and then in Luke 14, here it's the ruler of the Pharisees, and whilst there, Jesus tells the story of the wedding feast and the parable of the great banquet. More food. Luke 15. It's the parable of the last son, which ends, of course, with a big feast and a banquet. And then in Luke 19, he eats with Zacchaeus. Luke 22 has the last supper with his disciples. And Luke 24, after he meets some disciples on the road to Emmaus, they eat. They share a meal together. So if you were to ask what was Jesus' strategy for evangelism, you could say he ate with people. Jesus celebrated food. In fact, his first miracle, of course, was to turn water into wine as part of a wedding celebration. And throughout the Gospels, as we can see, Jesus is frequently eating with people. And when, before his crucifixion, he gathers with his disciples, he celebrates Passover and says how he longed to have that meal with him, with them. And what does he do to ask them to remember him? He does it by a meal. These are very familiar words to us, of course. When the hour came, Jesus' an apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For t I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember me when you eat. When you come together to eat, remember me. When you break this bread, something that they would have done with most meals, remember me. That's what Jesus is saying. He knows that they're going to be eating, and he wants to be a part of that gathering together. Remember me, remember me. The um, first three weeks of lockdown, um, some of you back in 2020, goodness, seems an awful long time ago now, doesn't it? But I remember those first three weeks for me just being so incredibly stressful. I was due to be at college starting my postgrad in theology, and suddenly the world is turned upside down, everything is online, church is being done differently, and I'm starting studying at the same time. And those first three weeks were just crazy. And I took communion every day. 
because it just kind of anchored me in who Jesus was, in who I was, and just helped me to keep going. And every Sunday evening, myself and Sally and Sally, we would do a WhatsApp video call together, and we would chat, and we would pray for one another, and we would break bread together, virtually, over WhatsApp. Because there's something so good about remembering Jesus in the ordinary every day, isn't there? Knowing who we are in those moments, that for me was a really important thing. So food was a big part of how Jesus reached people. And the fact that Jesus and his disciples were eating more than your average rabbi did not go unnoticed. In Luke 5, they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. The religious fasted. And, of course, we know from Matthew's gospel that some of the Pharisees would very much fast for show to make sure everybody knew that they were fasting. Jesus, of course, understood the significance of fasting. He himself fasted for 40 days and nights in the wilderness before he entered into his ministry. He knew the significant effect of fasting, but he also knew the significant effect of eating and eating with others. Luke 7.34 says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. See, the thing is, it wasn't really about the fact that he ate or how much he ate. It was who he ate with. Because eating with somebody was a sign of friendship. It was a symbol, really, of unity and acceptability. If you shared a meal with somebody, that was significant in terms of how you regarded them. So it was a strong accusation against Jesus to say that he ate with tax collectors and sinners. Now, there were, of course, certain rituals around food, and there were certain foods that were kosher foods that were acceptable foods to eat. But the Pharisees had imposed certain cleanliness laws that were actually only ever intended for priests. They'd imposed them on everybody, which meant that Jews almost never ate with Gentiles. And that was something that Jesus reversed. And in fact, throughout Luke's gospel, we see a great reversal in so many things. The first are last, the humble are exalted, and where if somebody um, touched a leper, they would become unclean. Of course, when Jesus touched them, the leper became clean. Jesus just turned everything around. And he also did that with who he ate with. He ate with the so-called unclean. Not only Gentiles, but tax collectors who were very much seen as the enemy because they were in collusion with the Romans. And the Romans were seen as the enemy of God. But Jesus, of course, eats with them, which was quite a shocking and scandalous thing to do. So when he calls Levi, who we know as Matthew, what's the first thing he does? Has a meal with them. Zacchaeus, he invites himself to dinner, which I always kind of rather like. Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. I think I'm going to try that. Gnarly, I'm coming to your house today. And I'm bringing 12 others with me for (laughs) dinner. Honoring people by food, I'm, I'm really aware, is different in different cultures. And we've got different cultures in the room here, different cultures around food and eating. And I know having traveled a bit and been on some missions overseas, it's important to certainly eat what you are given and, and to receive the honor that you're given when you are fed, no matter what it is. And that sometimes can be interesting. I remember going to Kenya with um, Alan and Mary and Maggie. I don't think they're here today. And um, we had a um, six 
a.m. flight from Birmingham to Amsterdam, first of all. So at the airport for four, probably up about half two in the morning, flew to Amsterdam, then we had a bit of a wait, then we flew down to Nairobi. We arrived at Nairobi probably 10 o'clock at night, going through baggage, all of that, and we're collected and we're taken to a guest house, and it's getting on for midnight at this point. So I've been up since half past two. I'm not great if I don't get sleep. People know that. And uh, I just remember literally being on my knees. I was so desperately tired. And we arrive in this lovely Christian um, guest house around midnight and are introduced into this room with a table that's just full of food. And I just wanted to cry. I didn't want to eat. <laughs> I was so desperately tired. But I knew these people had waited up for us and they wanted to honor us by giving us a meal. They knew we'd traveled a long way. So, of course, we ate and then eventually went to bed and then had to get up at five. It was, it was rather a challenge. Um, I think my only experience of that kind of thing was um, I remember going to Southern Ireland um, with a friend and we visited very various family. The Irish seem to want to feed you all the time has been my experience. I don't know if anyone else can uh, vouch for that. doesn't matter what time you arrive at somebody's house, there will be a full spread of food waiting for you. I think it's a bit different in our culture, but it's good to learn and it's good to receive honor from others and their cultures and to respect their cultures around food and see what they are. But of course, in Jesus' time, dining was a very different thing. For a start, people didn't sit at tables, they reclined at tables, which I always think must have been quite uncomfortable to kind of eat lying down. Um, but that's, of course, why feet um, were washed, because if you think of it, you've kind of got your head to where somebody's feet are, which wouldn't be the nicest. Um, feet were washed as well as hands, and oil was used to scent people's heads to give a lovely smell. And Jesus uses opportunities to share food with people to teach them. So in Luke 11, Jesus deliberately doesn't wash his hands before the meal. And they're all quite shocked at this because this is not the done thing. But he does it to talk about that it's, it's what's within a person that makes them unclean, not what's happening on the outside. And then in Luke 7, the situation is reversed because here Jesus is actually snubbed and he's not offered water and he's not offered oil. And then we have the beautiful story of the woman who comes in and washes his feet with her tears and with her alabaster jar, pours anointing oil on them. And Jesus talks about who has been forgiven much, loves much. He uses these everyday occurrences to share people the truth about God and who he is. He doesn't invite them to come and hear him speak. No, he goes to their homes. He shares a meal with them. And out of that, quite naturally, comes opportunities to share the truth about who God is. In this reclining at tables, there was also a definite ranking. The important people were at the top of the table, and the least important were at the bottom. You certainly knew where you stood when you were invited to dinner. In fact, Jesus addresses their attitudes. He says this in Luke 14. When you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I love how Jesus just turns things around. It meant that the people who were seen as being the lowest could easily get left out. And when the early church started to gather together, this is what the uh, Apostle Paul, which when he's writing in Corinthians, realizes is happening. The important people are getting fed well and getting fed first, and the seen as least important people are kind of pushed aside. And Paul is horrified when he sees this going on. This is what he says. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, 
for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. I think he's being a bit sarcastic there. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. And he goes on to instruct them in the Lord's Supper, words that we regularly use, which is the kind of true leveler, really, because we are all the same when it comes to sharing in the Lord's Supper. And it's hard not to include everybody when you're really truly focusing on what Jesus has done. Paul goes on, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. When they gathered as a body, everybody was to be included. People weren't to be left out. People weren't to go ahead with their own festivities and eating. Everybody was to be included because in Christ, we are all equal. We all equally sit at his table. But how easy it can be, and this is right at the beginning of the early church, to still have our own preferences, still have our own prejudices. It can be so easy, can't it? Who do we invite to our homes? Do we invite people who are just like us, or do we look to others? Jesus said in Luke 14, He said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. There are several points in this. Firstly, you've got the issue of kind of reciprocity, where you only invited somebody so you could get invited back. It was a way of kind of building your connections, of getting in with this person or in with that person. And then also, the important issue of inviting the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind. Because in those days, they were always excluded. In Leviticus, there are those who are unable to operate as priests um, if they are blind or lame, and it's a symbol of God's holiness. But the Pharisees took this to permanently exclude them from the temple altogether, which is why it's so significant on Palm Sunday when Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers. We read that he healed the the blind and the lame in the temple because they never otherwise would have been able to get in there. They certainly wouldn't have been able to afford the temple taxes that they put in place for people's offerings that they had to buy when Jesus pushed over those tables. He invited them in. That was a powerful thing that Jesus did because they were always being excluded in a way that was never God's intention. Jesus wants everyone included. He wants them invited in. And so he encourages us, when we eat, invite those who would otherwise be excluded. So who are those for us? Who are the people who would get excluded in our culture, in our times? It's an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? 
during one of our times of prayer a while ago, somebody had this picture. I saw the church and the unchurched seated around a table. Both were tasting of the goodness of God. And of course, with a round table, there's no sense of priority. There's no top table. Everybody's together, aren't they? Everybody is equal. Community lunch is a great thing that we do. I'm really grateful to the wonderful team of people who help and serve. And it, it is a good time to see church and unchurch sit together, actually. And um, maybe if you're perhaps a bit nervous about inviting someone to your house who you don't maybe know that well, then I would encourage you, if you can, to come along and, and do this. Come and enjoy a meal that we will cook for you here and sit with people around a table. It's wonderful, the conversations that you can have. But the main encouragement really is who are we inviting? Who are we sharing a meal with? Maybe even at work, do we take time to grab a lunch break? Do we sit with other colleagues? Who do we eat with? Who are the people that we share with? This is a quote from Simon Carey Holt. It is through the daily practice of the table that we live a life worth living. Through the table, we know who we are, where we come from, what we value and believe. At the table, we learn what it means to be family and how to live in responsible, loving relationships. Through the table, we live on neighborliness and citizenship, express our allegiance to particular places and communities, and claim our sense of home and belonging. At the table, we celebrate beauty and express solidarity with those who are broken and hungry. There's something about eating with people that's a really significant thing to do. And I think in our culture, if we're not careful, we can sometimes be a bit an Englishman's home is his castle and be a bit protective. I remember one time when I was in um, Zimbabwe with Sally and we were staying at um, a pastor's house. And for several days, I had no idea who lived in that house because there were so many different people there all the time. There were always different people there eating and having meals together. I, it got to about halfway through our time there when I actually clocked who, who was technically living in the house and who, who wasn't, because there was just always people there. It was just normal. People were eating there and sharing meals together all the time. And it was a really challenging thing, I feel. Opening our homes to people, sharing the kingdom of God with people is such a powerful thing. And that's why Jesus did it. Jesus took opportunities to eat with people because he knew he could share about who God was as he did that. The book that Ben referred to the other week um, from a guy called Michael Frost, um, Surprise the World, it's called here, Five Habits of Highly Missional People. He um, tells a little story. Um, it's American. Um, about a Southern Baptist minister who he meets. And I thought this was really interesting. He says, I remember meeting a Southern Baptist minister in Portland who told me his neighbor both claimed to make the best margaritas in all of Oregon and regularly hosted margarita and po poker nights in his garage. All the men from the neighborhood attended but the Baptist pastor never accepted an invitation to join them, believing this to be a strong witness to his faith. When I heard about this, I asked the pastor how many times his neighbor had asked him questions about his faith in Christ. Never, he replied. I asked how often he'd ever shared anything of his faith with his margarita-making margarita neighbor. Again, the answer was never. You see, it's not questionable when a Baptist refuses to attend a margarita and poker night. It's expected. 
I challenged this pastor to accept the next invitation he received, and he took me up on it. His neighbor nearly fell over in shock. The Baptist minister joined the gathering in the garage and true to his convictions, just drank soda. No one minded. He ended up having more conversations about his faith than he'd had in ages. What a powerful thing it can be to eat with people, or in this case, just to have a drink with people. So, Paul in Romans 12, 13 says, practice hospitality. Peter in 1 Peter 4, 9 says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. We're encouraged to be hospitable. And the challenge in this book is for each week to eat with three different people. One of them, not a member from your church or someone who is a Christian. So last week we were encouraged to bless and pray blessing over three different people. The the encouragement this week is to see in your week how you can eat with three different people. Maybe start with one, then go to two, go to three, see how it works. Maybe bring them to community lunch. But who are you inviting? Who are you eating with? It's an interesting thing to think about. One final quote. Sharing meals together on a regular basis is one of the most sacred practices we can engage in as believers. Missional hospitality is a tremendous opportunity to extend the kingdom of God. We can literally eat our way into the kingdom of God. If every Christian household regularly invited a stranger or a poor person into their home for a meal once a week, we would literally change the world by eating. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that when you came, you were fully God and you were fully man. And you spent your time eating with people. You spent your time eating with people that other people wouldn't sit with, wouldn't eat with. Lord, you encourage us to remember you as we eat. And you also encourage us to extend that arm of love to others, to offer hospitality. And so, Father God, I want to pray for all of us here that you would encourage us to maybe step out of our comfort zones and invite the stranger in. Lord, that we would share our table with others and in so doing, welcome the kingdom of God in, in a really special way. So, Father, maybe right now you want to just put into our minds somebody who we could invite. Maybe it's the person living next door. Maybe it's coming along to community lunch and sitting with someone you don't know. Father God, I pray that you will speak to us and that you will use these times for us to share your wonderful love that we've sung about this morning. So God, will you come, will you challenge us, will you use us, I pray, to be your instruments. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And as an opportunity to practice that this afternoon, um, I'm expecting you all to be back here for four so that we can share a meal together. Um, It's a bit of a catastrophe. The hog hasn't turned up. It may be, no, it won't be bread and water. Wa has been slaving away in the kitchen there with some meat, with quite a lot of meat. Um, So there is, as far as I can see, more than enough to go round. Please come. Sorry, thank you.
For those of you um, watching online, you haven't had the blessing while Andrea has been speaking of the smell of cooking pork wafting through the hall here, which was uh, a great... Um, a, a gr a great sort of sense of eating whilst Andrea was speaking. Um, so thank you, Andrea. That was a, a real blessing and a huge challenge. Um, so um, tea and coffee, as usual, served uh, in the lounge. And as Chris says, um, please come back at four o'clock. I think it's going to be, a, I'm sure it's going to be a great time. So the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you. Uh, as you go out into the world this week. May you be a blessing to everybody that you meet. Bless you all.